You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 63 The Interpretation of the Fire Festivals. Subsection 1 on the fire festivals in general. The foregoing survey of the popular fire festivals of Europe suggests some general observations. In the first place, we can hardly help being struck by the resemblance which the ceremonies bear to each other, at whatever time of the year and in whatever part of Europe they are celebrated, the custom of kindling great bonfires, leaping over them, and driving cattle through or around them, would seem to have been practically universal throughout Europe, and the same may be said of the processions or races with blazing torches round fields, orchards, pastures, or cattle stalls. Less widespread are the customs of hurling lighted discs into the air and trundling a burning wheel downhill. The ceremonial of the Yule Log is distinguished from that of the other fire festivals by the privacy and domesticity which characterize it. But this distinction may well be due simply to the rough weather of midwinter, which is apt not only to render a public assembly in the open air disagreeable, but also at any moment to defeat the object of the assembly by extinguishing the all-important fire under a downpour of rain or a fall of snow. Apart from these local or seasonal differences, the general resemblance between the fire festivals at all times of the year and in all places is tolerably close, and as the ceremonies themselves resemble each other, so do the benefits which the people expect to reap from them. Whether applied in the form of bonfires blazing at fixed points, or of torches carried about from place to place, or of embers and ashes taken from the smoldering heap of fuel, the fire is believed to promote the growth of the crops and the welfare of man and beast, either positively by stimulating them, or negatively by averting the dangers and calamities which threaten them from such causes as thunder and lightning, conflagration, blight, mildew, vermin, sterility, disease, and not least of all witchcraft. But we naturally ask, how did it come about that benefits, so great and manifold, were supposed to be attained by means so simple? In what way did people imagine that they could procure so many goods or avoid so many ills by the application of fire and smoke of embers and ashes? Two different explanations of the fire festivals have been given by modern inquirers. On the one hand, it has been held that they are sun charms or magical ceremonies intended, on the principle of imitative magic, to ensure a needful supply of sunshine for men, animals, and plants by kindling fires which mimic on earth the great source of light and heat in the sky. This was the view of Wilhelm Mannhardt. It may be called the solar theory. On the other hand, it has been maintained that the ceremonial fires have no necessary reference to the sun, but are simply purificatory in intention, being designed to burn up and destroy all harmful influences, whether these are conceived in a personal form as witches, demons, and monsters, or an impersonal form as a sort of pervading taint or corruption of the air. This is the view of Dr. Edward Westermark, and, apparently, of Professor Eugene Molk. It may be called the purificatory theory. Obviously, the two theories postulate two very different conceptions of the fire, which plays the principal part in the rites. On the one view, the fire, like sunshine, in our latitude, is a genial creative power which fosters the growth of plants and the development of all that makes for health and happiness. On the other view, the fire is a fierce, destructive power which blasts and consumes all the noxious elements, whether spiritual or material, that menace the life of men, of animals, and of plants. According to the one theory, the fire is a stimulant. According to the other, it is a disinfectant. On the one view, its virtue is positive. On the other, it is negative. Yet the two explanations, different as they are in the character which they attribute to the fire, are perhaps not wholly irreconcilable. If we assume that the fires kindled at these festivals were primarily intended to imitate the sun's light and heat, may we not regard the purificatory and disinfecting qualities, which popular opinion certainly appears to have ascribed to them, as attributes derived directly from the purificatory and disinfecting qualities of the sunshine? 
In this way, we might conclude that while the imitation of sunshine in these ceremonies was primary and original, the purification attributed to them was secondary and derivative. Such a conclusion, occupying an intermediate position between the two opposing theories and recognizing an element of truth in both of them, was adopted by me in earlier editions of this work, but in the meantime, Dr. Westermark has argued powerfully in favor of the purificatory theory alone, and I am bound to say that his arguments carry great weight, and that on a fuller review of the facts, the balance of evidence seems to me to incline decidedly in his favor. However, the case is not so clear as to justify us in dismissing the solar theory without discussion, and accordingly I propose to adduce the considerations which tell for it before proceeding to notice those which tell against it. A theory which had the support of so learned and sagacious an investigator as W. Manhart is entitled to respectful hearing. Subsection 2. The Solar Theory of the Fire Festivals in an earlier part of this work, we saw that savages resort to charms for making sunshine, and it would be no wonder if primitive man in Europe did the same. Indeed, when we consider that cold and cloudy climate of Europe, during a great part of the year, we shall find it natural that sun charms should have played a much more prominent part among the superstitious practices of European peoples than among those of savages who live nearer the equator and who consequently are apt to get in the course of nature more sunshine than they want. This view of the festivals may be supported by various arguments drawn partly from their dates, partly from the nature of the rites, and partly from the influence which they are believed to exert upon the weather and on vegetation. First, in regard to the dates of the festivals, it can be no mere accident that two of the most important and widely spread of the festivals are timed to coincide more or less exactly with the summer and winter solstices. That is, with the two turning points in the sun's apparent course in the sky, when he reaches respectively his highest and his lowest elevation at noon. Indeed, with respect to the midwinter celebration of Christmas, we are not left to conjecture. We know from the express testimony of the ancients that it was instituted by the church to supersede an old heathen festival of the birth of the sun, which was apparently conceived to be born again on the shortest day of the year, after which his light and heat were seen to grow till they attained their full maturity at midsummer. Therefore, it is no very far-fetched conjecture to suppose that the Yule log, which figures so prominently in the popular celebration of Christmas, was originally designed to help the laboring sun of midwinter to rekindle his seemingly expiring light. Not only the date of some of the festivals, but the manner of their celebration suggests a conscious imitation of the sun. The custom of rolling a burning wheel down a hill, which is often observed at these ceremonies, might well pass for an imitation of the sun's course in the sky, and the imitation would be especially appropriate on Midsummer Day, when the sun's annual dissension begins. Indeed, the custom has been thus interpreted by some of those who have recorded it. Not less graphic, it may be said, is the mimicry of his apparent revolution by swinging a burning tar barrel round a pole. Again, the common practice of throwing fiery discs, sometimes expressly said to be shaped like suns into the air at the festivals, may well be a piece of imitative magic. In these, as in so many cases, the magic force may be supposed to take effect through mimicry or sympathy. By imitating the desired result, you actually produce it. By counterfeiting the sun's progress through the heavens, you really help the luminary to pursue his celestial journey with punctuality and dispatch. The name, Fire of Heaven, by which the midsummer fire is sometimes popularly known, clearly implies a consciousness of a connection between the earthly and the heavenly flame. Again, the manner in which the fire appears to have been originally kindled on these occasions has been alleged in support of the view that it was intended to be a mock sun. As some scholars have perceived, it is highly probable that at the periodic festivals in former times, fire was universally obtained by the friction of two pieces of wood. It is still so procured in some places both at the Easter and the Midsummer festivals, and it is expressly said to have been formerly so procured at the Beltane celebration both in Scotland and Wales. But what makes it nearly certain that this was once the invariable mode of kindling the fire at these periodic festivals is the analogy of the need fire, which has almost always been produced by the friction of wood and sometimes by the revolution of a wheel. It is a plausible conjecture that the wheel employed for this purpose represents the sun, and if the fire at the regularly recurring celebrations were formerly produced in the same way, it might be regarded as a confirmation of the view that they were originally sun charms. In point of fact, there is, as Kuhn has indicated, some evidence to show that the midsummer fire was originally thus produced. We have seen 
that many Hungarian swineherds make fire on Midsummer Eve by rotating a wheel round a wooden axle wrapped in hemp, and that they drive their pigs through the fire thus made. At Obermedlingen in Swabia, the fire of heaven, as it was called, was made on St. Vitus's Day, the 15th of June. By igniting a cartwheel, which smeared with pitch and plated with straw, was fastened on a pole twelve feet high, the top of the pole being inserted in the nave of the wheel. This fire was made on the summit of a mountain, and as the flame ascended, the people uttered a set form of words, with eyes and arms directed heavenward. Here the fixing of the wheel on a pole and igniting it suggests that originally the fire was produced, as in the case of the need fire, by the revolution of a wheel. The day on which the ceremony takes place, the 15th of June, is near midsummer, and we have seen that in Masseron fire is, or used to be, actually made on midsummer day by turning a wheel rapidly about an oaken pole, though it is not said that the new fire so obtained is used to light the bonfire. However, we must bear in mind that, in all such cases, the use of a wheel may be merely a mechanical device to facilitate the operation of fire-making by increasing the friction. It need not have any symbolical significance. Further, the influence which these fires, whether periodic or occasional, are supposed to exert on the weather and vegetation may be cited in support of the view that they are sun charms, since the effects ascribed to them resemble those of sunshine. Thus, the French belief that in a rainy June, the lighting of the midsummer bonfires will cause the rain to cease appears to assume that they can disperse the dark clouds and make the sun to break out in radiant glory, drying the wet earth and dripping trees. Similarly, the use of the need fire by Swiss children on foggy days for the purpose of clearing away the mist may very naturally be interpreted as a sun charm. In the Vosges Mountains, the people believe that the midsummer fire helps to preserve the fruits of the earth and ensure good crops. In Sweden, the warmth or cold of the coming season is inferred from the direction in which the flames of the May Day bonfire are blown. If they blow to the south, it will be warm, if to the north, cold. No doubt, at present, the direction of the flames is regarded merely as an augury of the weather, not as a mode of influencing it. But, we may be pretty sure that this is one of the cases in which magic has dwindled into divination. So, in the Eiffel Mountains, when the smoke blows towards the cornfields, this is an omen that the harvest will be abundant. But the older view may have been not merely that the smoke and flames prognosticated, but that they actually produced an abundant harvest, the heat of the flames acting like sunshine on the corn. Perhaps it was with this view that people in the Isle of Man lit fires to windward of their fields in order that the smoke might blow over them. So, in South Africa, about the month of April, the metabolists light huge fires to the windward of their gardens, their idea being that the smoke, by passing over the crops, will assist the ripening of them. Among the Zulus also, medicine is burned on a fire placed to windward of their garden, the fumigation which the plants in consequence receive being held to improve the crop. Again, the idea of our European peasants, that the corn will grow well as far as the blaze of the bonfire is visible, may be interpreted as a remnant of the belief in the quickening and fertilizing power of the bonfires. The same belief, it may be argued, reappears in the notion that embers taken from the bonfire and inserted in the fields will promote the growth of the crops, and it may be thought to underlie the customs of sowing flaxseed in the direction in which the flames blow, of mixing the ashes of the bonfire and the seed corn at sowing of scattering the ashes by themselves over the field to fertilize it, and of incorporating a piece of the yule log in the plow to make the seeds thrive. The opinion that the flax or hemp will grow as high as the flames rise or the people leap over them belongs clearly to the same class of ideas. Again, at Cannes, on the banks of the Moselle, if the blazing wheel, which was trundled down the hillside, reached the river without being extinguished, this was hailed as a proof that the vintage would be abundant. So firmly was this belief held that the successful performance of the ceremony entitled the villagers to levy a tax upon the owners of the neighboring vineyards. Here, the unextinguished wheel might be taken to represent an unclouded sun, which in turn would portend an abundant vintage. So the wagon load of white wine, which the villagers received from the vineyards round about, might pass for a payment for the sunshine which they had procured from the grapes. Similarly, in the Vale of Glamorgan, a blazing wheel used to be trundled downhill on Midsummer Day, and if the fire were extinguished before the wheel reached the foot of the hill, the people expected a bad harvest, whereas if the wheel kept alight all the way down and continued to blaze for a long time, the farmers looked forward to heavy crops that summer. 
Here again, it is natural to suppose that the rustic mind traced a direct connection between the fire of the wheel and the fire of the sun, on which the crops are dependent. But in popular belief, the quickening and fertilizing influence of the bonfires is not limited to the vegetable world. It extends also to animals. This plainly appears from the Irish custom of driving barren cattle through the midsummer fires, from the French belief that the yule log steeped in water helps cows to calve, from the French and Serbian notion that there will be as many chickens, calves, lambs, and kids as there are sparks struck out of the yule log from the French custom of putting the ashes of the bonfires in the fowl's nests to make the hens lay eggs, and from the German practice of mixing the ashes of the bonfires with the drink of cattle in order to make the animals thrive. Further, there are clear indications that even human fecundity is supposed to be promoted by the genial heat of the fires. In Morocco, the people think that childless couples can obtain offspring by leaping over the midsummer bonfire. It is an Irish belief that a girl who jumps thrice over the midsummer bonfire will soon marry and become the mother of many children. In Flanders, women leap over the midsummer fires to ensure an easy delivery. In various parts of France, they think that if a girl dances round nine fires, she will be sure to marry within the year. And in Bohemia, they fancy that she will do so if she merely sees nine of the bonfires. On the other hand, in the Crane, people say that if a young man and woman, leaping over the midsummer fire together, escape unsmirched, the young woman will not become a mother within twelve months. The flames have not touched and fertilized her. In parts of Switzerland and France, the lighting of the Yule log is accompanied by a prayer that the women may bear children, and she-goats bring forth kids, and the ewes drop lambs. The rule observed in some places that the bonfires should be kindled by the person who was last married seems to belong to the same class of ideas, whether it be that such a person is supposed to receive from or to impart to the fire a generative and fertilizing influence. The common practice of lovers leaping over the fires hand in hand may very well have originated in a notion that thereby their marriage would be blessed with offspring, and the like motive would explain the custom which obliges couples married within the year to dance to the light of torches, and the scenes of profligacy which appear to have marked the midsummer celebration among the Estonians, as they once marked the celebration of May Day among ourselves, may have sprung not from the mere license of holiday-makers, but from a crude notion that such orgies were justified, if not required, by some mysterious bond which linked the life of man to the courses of the heavens at this turning point of the year. At the festivals which we are considering, the custom of kindling bonfires is commonly associated with a custom of carrying lighted torches about the fields, the orchards, the pastures, the flocks, and the herds, and we can hardly doubt that the two customs are only two different ways of attaining the same object, namely the benefits, which are believed to flow from the fire, whether it be stationary or portable. Accordingly, if we accept the solar theory of the bonfires, we seem bound to apply it also to the torches. We must suppose that the practice of marching or running with blazing torches about the country is simply a means of diffusing far and wide the genial influence of the sunshine of which these flickering flames are a feeble imitation. In favor of this view, it may be said that sometimes the torches are carried about the fields for the express purpose of fertilizing them, and with the same intention, live coals from the bonfires are sometimes placed in the fields to prevent blight. On the eve of Twelfth Day, in Normandy, men, women, and children run wildly through the fields and orchards with lighted torches, which they wave about the branches and dash against the trunks of the fruit trees for the sake of burning the moss and driving away the moles and field mice. They believe that the ceremony fulfills the double object of exercising the vermin, whose multiplication would be a real calamity, and of imparting fecundity to the trees, the fields, and even the cattle. And they imagine that the more the ceremony is prolonged, the greater will be the crop of fruit next autumn. In Bohemia, they say that the corn will grow as high as they fling the blazing besoms into the air, nor are such notions confined to Europe. In Korea, a few days before the New Year festival, the eunuchs of the palace swing burning torches, chanting invocations the while and this is supposed to ensure bountiful crops for the next season. The custom of trundling a burning wheel over the fields, which used to be observed in Poitou for the express purpose of fertilizing them, may be thought to embody the same idea in a still more graphic form. Since in this way, the mock sun itself, not merely its light and heat, represented by torches, is made actually to pass over the ground, which is to receive its quickening and kindly influence. Once more, the custom of carrying lighted brands round cattle is plainly equivalent to driving the animals through the bonfire. 
and if the bonfire is a sun charm, the torches must be so also. Subsection 3. The Purificatory Theory of the Fire Festivals Thus far, we have considered what may be said for the theory that at the European fire festivals, the fire is kindled as a charm to ensure an abundant supply of sunshine for man and beast, for corn and fruits. It remains to consider what may be said against this theory, and in favor of the view that in these rites, fire is employed not as a creative, but as a cleansing agent, which purifies men, animals, and plants by burning up and consuming the noxious elements, whether material or spiritual, which menace all living things with disease and death. First, then, it is to be observed that the people who practice the fire customs appear never to allege the solar theory in explanation of them, while on the contrary, they do frequently and emphatically put forward the purificatory theory. This is a strong argument in favor of the purificatory and against the solar theory, for the popular explanation of the popular custom is never to be rejected except for grave cause, and in the present case there seems to be no adequate reason for rejecting it. The conception of fire as a destructive agent, which can be turned to account for the consumption of evil things, is so simple and obvious that it could hardly escape the minds even of the rude peasantry with whom these festivals originated. On the other hand, the conception of fire as an emanation of the sun Sun, or at all events as linked to it by a bond of physical sympathy, is far less simple and obvious, and though the use of fire as a charm to produce sunshine appears to be undeniable, nevertheless, in attempting to explain popular customs, we should never have recourse to a more recondite idea when a simpler one lies to hand and is supported by the explicit testimony of the people themselves. Now, in the case of the fire festivals, the destructive aspect of the fire is one upon which the people dwell again and again, and it is highly significant that the great evil against which the fire is directed appears to be witchcraft. Again and again, we are told that the fires are intended to burn or repel the witches, and the intention is sometimes graphically expressed by burning an effigy of a witch in the fire. Hence, when we remember the great hold which the dread of witchcraft has had on the popular European mind in all ages, we may suspect that the primary intention of all these fire festivals was simply to destroy, or at all events, get rid of the witches, who were regarded as the causes of nearly all the misfortunes and calamities that befall men, their cattle and their crops. This suspicion is confirmed when we examine the evils for which the bonfires and torches were supposed to provide a remedy. Foremost, perhaps, among these evils, we may reckon the diseases of cattle, and of all the ills that witches are believed to work, there is probably none which is so constantly insisted on as the harm they do to the herds particularly by stealing the milk from the cows. Now it is significant that the need fire, which may perhaps be regarded as the parent of the periodic fire festivals, is kindled above all as a remedy for a moraine or other disease of cattle, and the circumstance suggests, what on general grounds seems probable, that the custom of kindling the need fire goes back to a time when the ancestors of European peoples subsisted chiefly on the products of their herds, and when agriculture as yet played a subordinate part in their lives. Witches and wolves are the two great foes still dreaded by the herdsmen in many parts of Europe, and we need not wonder that he should resort to fire as a powerful means of banning them both. Among Slavonic peoples, Peoples, it appears that the foes whom the need fire is designed to combat are not so much living witches as vampires and other evil spirits, and the ceremony aims rather at repelling these baleful beings than at actually consuming them in the flames. But for our present purpose, these distinctions are immaterial. The important thing to observe is that among the Slavs, the need fire, which is probably the original of all the ceremonial fires, now under consideration, is not a sun charm, but clearly and unmistakably nothing but a means of protecting man and beast against the attacks of maleficent creatures, whom the peasants think to burn or scare by the heat of the fire just as he might burn or scare wild animals. Again, the bonfires are often supposed to protect the fields against hail and the homestead, against thunder and lightning. But both hail and thunderstorms are frequently thought to be caused by witches. Hence, the fire which bans the witches necessarily serves, at the same time, as a talisman against hail, thunder, and lightning. Further, brands taken from the bonfires are commonly kept in the houses to guard them against conflagration, and though this may perhaps be done on the principle of homeopathic magic, one fire being thought to act as a preventative of another, it is also possible that the intention may be to keep witch incendiaries at bay, 
Again, people leap over the bonfires as a preventative of colic and look at the flames steadily in order to preserve their eyes in good health. And both colic and sore eyes are in Germany and probably elsewhere, set down to the machinations of witches. Once more, to leap over the midsummer fires or to circumambulate them is thought to prevent a person from feeling pains in his back at reaping. And in Germany, such pains are called witch shots and ascribed to witchcraft. But if the bonfires and torches of the fire festivals are to be regarded primarily as weapons directed against witches and wizards, it becomes probable that the same explanation applies not only to the flaming discs, which are hurled into the air, but also to the burning wheels, which are rolled down hill on these occasions. Discs and wheels, we may suppose, are alike intended to burn the witches, who hover invisible in the air or haunt unseen the fields, the orchards, and the vineyards on the hillside. Certainly, witches are constantly thought to ride through the air on broomsticks or other equally convenient vehicles, and if they do so, how can you get at them so effectually as by hurling lighted missiles, whether discs, torches, or besoms, after them as they flit past overhead in the gloom? The South Slovenian peasant believes that witches ride in the dark hail clouds, so he shoots at the clouds to bring down the hags, while he curses them, saying, Curse, curse, Herodias, thy mother is a heathen, damned of God, and fettered through the Redeemer's blood. Also, he brings out a pot of glowing charcoal, on which he has thrown holy oil, laurel leaves, and wormwood to make a smoke. The fumes are supposed to ascend to the clouds and stupefy the witches, so that they tumble down to earth. And in order that they may not fall soft, but may hurt themselves very much, the yokel hastily brings out a chair and tilts it bottom up, so the witch, in falling, may break her legs on the legs of the chair. Worse than that, he cruelly lays scythes, billhooks, and other formidable weapons edge upwards, so as to cut and mangle the poor wretches when they drop plumb upon them from the clouds. On this view, the fertility supposed to follow the application of fire in the form of bonfires, torches, discs, rolling wheels, and so forth, is not conceived as resulting directly from an increase of solar heat, which the fire has magically generated. It is merely an indirect result obtained by freeing the reproductive powers of plants and animals from the fatal obstruction of witchcraft. And what is true of the reproduction of plants and animals may hold good also of the fertility of the human sexes. The bonfires are supposed to promote marriage and to procure offspring for childless couples. This happy effect need not flow directly from any quickening or fertilizing energy in the fire. It may follow indirectly from the power of the fire to remove those obstacles which the spells of witches and wizards notoriously present to the union of man and wife. On the whole, then, the theory of the purificatory virtue of the ceremony fires appears more probable and more in accordance with the evidence than the opposing theory of their connection with the sun. Chapter 64. The Burning of Human Beings in the Fires. Subsection 1. The Burning of Effigies in the Fires. We have still to ask, what is the meaning of burning effigies in the fire at these festivals? After the preceding investigation, the answer to the question seems obvious. As the fires are often alleged to be kindled for the purpose of burning the witches, and as the effigy burnt in them is sometimes called the witch, we might naturally be disposed to conclude that all the effigies consumed in the flames on these occasions represent witches or warlocks, and that the custom of burning them is merely a substitute for burning the wicked men and women themselves, since on the principle of homeopathic or imitative magic you practically destroy the witch herself in destroying her effigy. On the whole, this explanation of the burning of straw figures in human shape at the festivals is perhaps the most probable. Yet it may be that this explanation does not apply to all the cases, and that certain of them may admit and even require another interpretation. For the effigies so burned, as I have already remarked, can hardly be separated from the effigies of death, which are burned or otherwise destroyed in spring, and grounds have been already given for regarding the so-called effigies of death as really representatives of the tree spirit or spirit of vegetation. Are the other effigies, which are burned in the spring and midsummer bonfires, susceptible of the same explanation? It would seem so, for just as the fragments of the so-called death are stuck in the field to make the crops grow, so the charred embers of the figure burned in the spring bonfires are sometimes laid on the fields in the belief that they will keep vermin from the crop. 
Again, the rule that the last married bride must leap over the fire in which the straw man is burned on Shrove Tuesday is probably intended to make her fruitful. But, as we have seen, the power of blessing women with offspring is a special attribute of tree spirits. It is therefore a fair presumption that the burning effigy over which the bride must leap is a representative of the fertilizing tree spirit or spirit of vegetation. This character of the effigy, as representative of the spirit of vegetation, is almost unmistakable when the figure is composed of an unthreshed sheaf of corn, or is covered from head to foot with flowers. Again, it is to be noted that, instead of a puppet, trees, either living or felled, are sometimes burned both in the spring and midsummer bonfires. Now, considering the frequency with which the tree spirit is represented in human shape, it is hardly rash to suppose that when sometimes a tree and sometimes an effigy is burned in these fires, the effigy and the tree are regarded as equivalent to each other, each being a representative of the tree spirit. This again is confirmed by observing, first, that sometimes the effigy which is to be burned is carried about simultaneously with a may tree, the former being carried by the boys, the latter by the girls, and second, that the effigy is sometimes tied to a living tree and burned with it. In these cases, we can scarcely doubt the tree spirit is represented, as we have found it represented before in duplicate, both by the tree and by the effigy. That the true character of the effigy as a representative of the beneficent spirit of vegetation should sometimes be forgotten is natural. The custom of burning a beneficent god is too foreign to later modes of thought to escape misinterpretation. Naturally enough, the people who continued to burn this image came in time to identify it as the effigy of persons whom, on various grounds, they regarded with aversions, such as Judas Iscariot, Luther, and a witch. The general reasons for killing a god or his representative have been examined in a preceding chapter, but when the god happens to be a deity of vegetation, there are special reasons why he should die by fire, for light and heat are necessary to vegetable growth, and, on the principle of sympathetic magic, by subjecting the personal representative of vegetation to their influence, you secure a supply of these necessaries for trees and crops. In other words, by burning the spirit of vegetation in a fire which represents the sun, you make sure that, for a time at least, vegetation shall have plenty of sun. It may be objected that, if the intention is simply to secure enough sunshine for vegetation, this end would be better attained on the principles of sympathetic magic by merely passing the representative of vegetation through the fire instead of burning him. In point of fact, this is sometimes done. In Russia, as we have seen, the straw figure of Kapalo is not burned in the midsummer fire, but merely carried backwards and forwards across it. But, for the reasons already given, it is necessary that the god should die. So next day, Kapalo is stripped of her ornaments and thrown into a stream. In the Russian custom, the passage of the image through the fire, if it is not simply a purification, may possibly be a sun charm. The killing of the god is a separate act, and the mode of killing him by drowning is probably a rain charm. But usually, people have not thought it necessary to draw this fine distinction, for the various reasons already assigned. It is advantageous, they think, to expose the god of vegetation to a considerable degree of heat, and it is also advantageous to kill him, and they combine these advantages in a rough and ready way by burning him. Subsection 2. The Burning of Men and Animals in the Fires in the popular customs connected with the fire festivals of Europe, there are certain features which appear to point to a former practice of human sacrifice. We have seen reasons for believing that in Europe, living persons have often acted as representatives of the tree spirit and corn spirit, and have suffered death as such. There is no reason, therefore, why they should not have been burned, if any special advantages were likely to be attained by putting them to death in that way. The consideration of human suffering is not one which enters into the calculations of primitive man. Now, in the fire festivals, which we are discussing, the pretense of burning people is sometimes carried so far that it seems reasonable to regard it as a mitigated survival of an older custom of actually burning them. Thus, in Aken, as we saw, the man clad in peas straw acts so cleverly that the children really believe he is being burned. At Jumige, in Normandy, the man clad all in green, who bore the title of the Green Wolf, was pursued by his comrades, and when they caught him, they feigned to fling him upon the midsummer bonfire. Similarly, at the Beltane fires in Scotland, the pretended victim was seized, and a show made of throwing him into the flames, and for some time afterwards, people affected to speak of him as dead. Again, in the Halloween bonfires of northeastern Scotland, we may perhaps detect a similar pretense in the custom observed by a lad of lying down as close to the fire as possible, and allowing other lads to leap over him. 
The titular king at Ace, who reigned for a year and danced the first dance from the midsummer bonfire, may perhaps in days of old have discharged the less agreeable duty of serving as fuel for the fire, which in later times he only kindled. In the following customs, Manhart is probably right in recognizing traces of an old custom of burning a leaf-clad representative of the spirit of vegetation. At Wolfick in Austria, on Midsummer Day, a boy completely clad in green fir branches goes from house to house accompanied by a noisy crew, collecting wood for the bonfire. As he gets the wood, he sings, Forest trees I want, no sour milk for me, but beer and wine, so can the woodman be jolly and gay. In some parts of Bavaria, also, the boys who go from house to house collecting fuel for the midsummer bonfire envelop one of their number from head to foot in green branches of firs and lead him by a rope through the whole village. At Musheim in Württemberg, the festival of St. John's Fire usually lasted for 14 days, ending on the second Sunday after Midsummer Day. On this last day, the bonfire was left in charge of the children, while the older people retired to a wood. Here they encased a young fellow in leaves and twigs, who, thus disguised, went to the fire, scattered it, and trod it out. All the people present fled at the sight of him. But it seems possible to go farther than this. Of human sacrifices offered on these occasions, the most unequivocal traces, as we have seen, are those which, about a hundred years ago, still lingered at the Beltane fires in the highlands of Scotland, that is, among a Celtic people who, situated in a remote corner of Europe and almost completely isolated from foreign influence, had till then conserved their old heathenism better perhaps than any other people in the west of Europe. It is significant, therefore, that human sacrifices by fire are known, on unquestionable evidence, to have been systematically practiced by the Celts. The earliest description of these sacrifices has been bequeathed to us by Julius Caesar. As conqueror of the hitherto independent Celts of Gaul, Caesar had ample opportunity of observing the national Celtic religion and manners. While these were still fresh and crisp from the native mint and had not yet been infused in the melting pot of Roman civilization, with his own notes, Caesar appears to have incorporated the observations of a Greek explorer by name Posidinius, who traveled in Gaul about 50 years before Caesar carried the Roman arms to the English Channel. The Greek geographer Strabo and the historian Diodorus seem also to have derived their descriptions of the Celtic sacrifices from the work of Poseidonius, but independently of each other, and of Caesar, for each of the three derivative accounts contains some details which are not to be found in either of the others. By combining them, therefore, we can restore the original account of Poseidonius with some probability, and thus obtain a picture of the sacrifices offered by the Celts of Gaul at the close of the second century before our era. The following seem to have been the main outlines of the custom. Condemned criminals were reserved by the Celts in order to be sacrificed to the gods at a great festival which took place once in every five years. The more there were of such victims, the greater was believed to be the fertility of the land. If there were not enough criminals to furnish victims, captives taken in war were immolated to supply the deficiency. When the time came, the victims were sacrificed by the druids or priests. Some they shot down with arrows, some they impaled, and some they burned alive in the following manner. Colossal images of wickerwork, or of wood and grass, were constructed. These were filled with live men, cattle, and animals of other kinds. Fire was then applied to the images, and they were burned with their living contents. Such were the great festivals held once every five years, but besides these quinquennial festivals, celebrated on so grand a scale and with apparently so large an expenditure of human life, it seems reasonable to suppose that festivals of the same sort, only on a lesser scale, were held annually, and that from these annual festivals are lineally descended some at least of the fire festivals which, with their traces of human sacrifices, are still celebrated year by year in many parts of Europe." The gigantic images constructed of osiers, or covered with grass, in which the druids enclose their victims, remind us of the leafy framework in which the human representative of the tree spirit is still so often encased. Hence, seeing that the fertility of the land was apparently supposed to depend upon the due performance of these sacrifices, Manhart interpreted the Celtic victims, cased in osiers and grass, as representatives of the tree spirit or spirit of vegetation. These wicker giants of the druids seem to have had, till lately, if not down to the present time, the representatives at the spring and midsummer festivals of modern Europe. At Douay, down at least to the early part of the 19th century, a procession took place annually on the Sunday near to the 7th of July. 
The great feature of the procession was a colossal figure, some twenty or thirty feet high, made of osiers, and called the giant, which was moved through the streets by means of rollers and ropes, worked by men who were enclosed within the effigy. The figure was armed as a knight with lance and sword, helmet and shield. Behind him marched his wife and his three children, all constructed of osiers on the same principle, but on a smaller scale. At Dunkirk, the procession of the giants took place on Midsummer Day, the 24th of June. The festival, which was known as the Follies of Dunkirk, attracted multitudes of spectators. The giant was a huge figure of wickerwork, occasionally as much as 45 feet high, dressed in a long blue robe and gold stripes, which reached to his feet, concealing the dozen or more men who made it dance and bob its head to the spectators. This colossal effigy went by the name of Papa Raus, and carried in its pocket a bouncing infant of Brobdenagian proportions. The rear was brought up by the daughter of the giant, constructed like her sire of wicker work, and little, if at all, inferior to him in size. Most towns and even villages of Brabant and Flanders have or used to have similar wicker giants, which were annually led about to the delight of the populace, who loved these grotesque figures, spoke of them with patriotic enthusiasm, and never wearied of gazing at them. At Antwerp, the giant was so big that no gate in the city was large enough to let him go through. Hence, he could not visit his brother giants in neighboring towns, as the other Belgian giants used to do on solemn occasions. In England, artificial giants seem to have been a standing feature of the Midsummer Festival. A writer of the 16th century speaks of Midsummer pageants in London, where to make the people wonder, are set forth great and ugly giants, marching as if they were alive and armed at all points, but within they are stuffed full of brown paper and tow, which the shrewd boys under peering do guilfully discover and turn to a great derision. At Chester, the annual pageant on Midsummer Eve included the effigies of four giants, with animals, hobby horses, and other figures. At Coventry, it appears that the giant's wife figured beside the giant. At Burford, in Oxfordshire, Midsummer Eve used to be celebrated with great jollity by the carrying of a giant and a dragon up and down the town. The last survivor of these perambulating English giants lingered at Salisbury, where an antiquary found him moldering to decay in the neglected hall of the tailor's company about the year 1844. His bodily framework was a lath and hoop, like the one which used to be worn in Jack and the Green on May Day. In these cases, the giants merely figured in the processions, but sometimes they were burned in the summer bonfires. Thus, the people of the Rue aux Ars in Paris used annually to make a great wickerwork figure, dressed as a soldier, which they promenaded up and down the streets for several days, and solemnly burned on the 3rd of July. The crowd of spectators singing Salve Regina, a personage who bore the title of king, presided over the ceremony with a lighted torch in his hand. The burning fragments of the image were scattered among the people who eagerly scrambled for them. The custom was abolished in 1743 in Brie, Isle de France. A wickerwork giant, 18 feet high, was annually burned on Midsummer Eve. Again, the druidical custom of burning live animals enclosed in wickerwork has its counterpart at the spring and midsummer festivals. At Lucan, in the Pyrenees on Midsummer Eve, a hollow column composed of strong wickerwork is raised to the height of about 60 feet in the center of the principal suburb and interlaced with green foliage up to the very top, while the most beautiful flowers and shrubs procurable are artistically arranged in groups below so as to form a sort of background to the scene. The column is then filled with combustible materials ready for ignition. At an appointed hour, about 8 p.m., a grand procession composed of the clergy, followed by young men and maidens in holiday attire, pour forth from the town chanting hymns and take up their position around the column. Meanwhile, bonfires are lit with beautiful effect in the surrounding hills. As many living serpents as could be collected are now thrown into the column, which is set on fire at the base by means of torches, armed with which about fifty boys and men dance around the frantic gestures. The serpents, to avoid the flames, wriggle their way to the top, whence they are seen lashing out laterally until finally obliged to drop, their struggles for life giving rise to enthusiastic delight among the surrounding spectators. This is a favorite annual ceremony for the inhabitants of Lucan and its neighborhood, and local tradition assigns it to a heathen origin. In the midsummer fires formerly kindled on the Place de Grave at Paris, it was the custom to burn a basket barrel or sack full of live cats, which was flung from a tall mast in the midst of the bonfire. Sometimes a fox was burned. The people collected the embers and ashes of the fire and took them home, believing that they brought good luck. The French kings often witnessed these spectacles and even lit the bonfire with their own hands. 
in 1648, Louis XIV, crowned with a wreath of roses and carrying a bunch of roses in his hand, kindled the fire, danced at it, and partook of the banquet afterwards in the town hall. But this was the last occasion when a monarch presided at the Midsummer Bonfire in Paris. At Metz, Midsummer fires were lighted with great pomp on the Esplanade, and a dozen cats enclosed in wicker cages were burned alive in them, to the amusement of the people. Similarly, at Gap, in the department of the High Alps, cats used to be roasted over the Midsummer bonfire. In Russia, a white cock was sometimes burned in the Midsummer bonfire. In Maison or Thuringia, a horse's head used to be thrown into it. Sometimes animals are burned in the spring bonfires. In the Vosges, cats were burned on Shrove Tuesday. In Alsace, they were thrown into the Easter bonfire. In the department of the Ardennes, cats were flung into the bonfires kindled on the first Sunday in Lent. Sometimes, by a refinement of cruelty, they were hung over the fire from the end of a pole and roasted alive. The cat, which represented the devil, could never suffer enough. While the creatures were perishing in the flames, the shepherds guarded their flocks and forced them to leap over the fire, esteeming this an infallible means of preserving them from disease and witchcraft. We have seen that squirrels were sometimes burned in the Easter fire. Thus, it appears that the sacrificial rites of the Celts of ancient Gaul can be traced in the popular festivals of modern Europe. Naturally, it is in France, or rather in the wider area comprised within the limits of ancient Gaul, that these rites have left the clearest traces in the customs of burning giants of wicker work and animals enclosed in wicker work or baskets. These customs, it will have been remarked, are generally observed at or about midsummer. From this, we may infer that the original rites of which these are the degenerate successors were solemnized at midsummer. This inference harmonizes with the conclusion suggested by a general survey of European folk custom that the midsummer festival must, on the whole, have been the most widely diffused and the most solemn of all the yearly festivals celebrated by the primitive Aryans in Europe. At the same time, we must bear in mind that among the British Celts, the chief fire festivals of the year appear, certainly, to have been those of Beltane, May Day, and Halloween, the last day of October. And this suggests a doubt whether the Celts of Gaul also may not have celebrated their principal rites of fire, including their burnt sacrifices of men and animals, at the beginning of May or the beginning of November, rather than at midsummer. We have still to ask, what is the meaning of such sacrifices? Why were men and animals burnt to death at these festivals? If we are right in interpreting the modern European fire festivals as attempts to break the power of witchcraft by burning or banning the witches and warlocks, it seems to follow that we must explain the human sacrifice sacrifices of the Celts in the same manner. That is, we must suppose that the men whom the Druids burnt in wickerwork images were condemned to death on the grounds that they were witches or wizards, and that the mode of execution by fire was chosen because burning alive is deemed the surest mode of getting rid of these noxious and dangerous beings. The same explanation would apply to the cattle and wild animals of many kinds which the Celts burned along with the men. They too, we may conjecture, were supposed to be either under the spell of witchcraft or actually to be the witches and wizards who had transformed themselves into animals for the purpose of prosecuting their infernal plots against the welfare of their fellow creatures. This conjecture is confirmed by the observation that the victims most commonly burned in modern bonfires have been cats, and that cats are precisely the animals into which, with the possible exception of hares, witches were most usually supposed to transform themselves. Again, we have seen that serpents and foxes used sometimes to be burned in the midsummer fires, and Welsh and German witches are reported to have assumed the form of both foxes and serpents. In short, when we remember the great variety of animals whose forms witches can assume at pleasure, it seems easy on this hypothesis to account for the variety of living creatures that have been burned at festivals both in ancient Gaul and modern Europe. All these victims, we may surmise, were doomed to the flames, not because they were animals, but because they were believed to be witches who had taken the shape of animals for their nefarious purposes. One advantage of explaining the ancient Celtic sacrifices in this way is that it introduces, as it were, a harmony and consistency into the treatment which Europe has meted out to witches from the earliest times down to about two centuries ago, when the growing influence of rationalism discredited the belief in witchcraft and put a stop to the custom of burning witches. Be that as it may, we can now perhaps understand why the Druids believed that the more persons they sentenced to death, the greater would be the fertility of the land. To a modern reader, the connection at first sight may not be obvious between the activity of the hangman and the productivity of the earth, but a little reflection may satisfy him that when the criminals who perish at the stake or on the gallows are witches, 
whose delight it is to blight the crops of the farmer or to lay them low under storms of hail. The execution of these witches is really calculated to ensure an abundant harvest by removing one of the principal causes which paralyze the efforts and blast the hopes of the husbandman. The druidical sacrifices, which we are considering, were explained in a different way by W. Manhart. He supposed that the men whom the druids burned in wickerwork images represented the spirits of vegetation, and accordingly that the custom of burning them was a magical ceremony intended to secure the necessary sunshine for the crops. Similarly, he seems to have inclined to the view that the animals which used to be burnt in the bonfires represented the corn spirit, which, as we saw in an earlier part of this work, is often supposed to assume the shape of an animal. This theory is no doubt tenable, and the great authority of W. Manhart entitles it to careful consideration. I adopted it in former editions of this book, but on reconsideration, it seems to me on the whole to be less probable than the theory that the men and animals burnt in the fires perished in the character of witches. This latter view is strongly supported by the testimony of the people who celebrate the fire festivals, since a popular name for the custom of kindling the fires is burning the witches. Effigies of witches are sometimes consumed in the flames and the fires. Their embers, or their ashes, are supposed to furnish protection against witchcraft. On the other hand, there is little to show that the effigies or the animals burnt in the fires are regarded by the people as representatives of the vegetation spirit, and that the bonfires are sun charms. With regard to the serpents in particular, which used to be burnt in the midsummer fire at Lucan, I am not aware of any certain evidence that in Europe snakes have been regarded as embodiments of the tree spirit or corn spirit, though in other parts of the world the conception appears to be not unknown. Whereas the popular faith in the transformation of witches into animals is so general and deeply rooted, and the fear of these uncanny beings is so strong that it seems safer to suppose that the cats and other animals which were burnt in the fire suffered death as embodiments of witches than that they perished as representatives of vegetation spirits. Chapter 65. Balder and the Mistletoe the reader may remember that the preceding account of the popular fire festivals of europe was suggested by the myth of the norse god baldur who is said to have been slain by a bunch of mistletoe and burned in a great fire we have now to inquire how far the customs which have been passed in review help to shed light on the myth in this enquiry it may be convenient to begin with the mistletoe the instrument of baldur's death from time immemorial the mistletoe has been the object of superstitious veneration in europe it was worshipped by the druids as we learn from a famous passage by pliny after enumerating the different kinds of mistletoe he proceeds in treating of this subject the admiration in which the mistletoe is held throughout gaul ought not to pass unnoticed the druids for so they call their wizards esteem nothing more sacred than the mistletoe and the tree on which it grows provided only that the tree is an oak but apart from this they choose oak woods for their sacred groves and perform no sacred rites without oak leaves so that the very name of druids may be regarded as a greek appellation derived from their worship of the oak for they believe that whatever grows on these trees is sent from heaven and is a sign that the tree has been chosen by the god himself the mistletoe is very rarely to be met with but when it is found they gather it with solemn ceremony this they do above all on the sixth day of the moon from whence they date the beginnings of their months of their years and of their thirty year cycle because by the sixth day the moon has plenty of vigour and has not run half its course after due preparations have been made for a sacrifice and a feast under the tree they hail it as the universal healer and bring to the spot two white bulls whose horns have never been bound before a priest clad in a white robe climbs the tree and with a golden sickle cuts the mistletoe which is caught in a white cloth then they sacrifice the victims praying that god may make his own gift to prosper with those upon whom he has bestowed it they believe that a potion prepared from mistletoe will make barren animals to bring forth and that the plant is a remedy against all poison in another passage pliny tells us that in medicine the mistletoe which grows on an oak was esteemed the most efficacious and that its efficacy was by some superstitious people supposed to be increased if the plant was gathered on the first day of the moon without the use of iron and if when gathered it was not allowed to touch the earth oak mistletoe thus obtained was deemed a cure for epilepsy carried about by women it assisted them to conceive and it healed ulcers most effectually if only the sufferer chewed a piece of the plant and laid another piece on the sore 
Yet again, he says that mistletoe was supposed, like vinegar and an egg, to be an excellent means of extinguishing a fire. If in these latter passages Pliny refers, as he apparently does, to the beliefs current among his contemporaries in Italy, it will follow that the Druids and the Italians were to some extent agreed as to the valuable properties possessed by mistletoe which grows on an oak. Both of them deemed it an effectual remedy for a number of ailments, and both of them ascribed to it a quickening virtue the Druids believing that a potion prepared from mistletoe would fertilize barren cattle, and the Italians holding that a piece of mistletoe carried about by a woman would help her to conceive a child. Further, both peoples thought that if the plant were to exert its medicinal properties, it must be gathered in a certain way and at a certain time. It might not be cut with iron, hence the Druids cut it with gold, and it might not touch the earth, hence the Druids caught it in a white cloth." in choosing the time for gathering the plant both peoples were determined by observation of the moon only they differed as to the particular day of the moon the italians preferring the first and the druids the sixth with these beliefs of the ancient gauls and italians as to the wonderful medicinal properties of mistletoe we may compare the similar beliefs of the modern aino of japan we read that they like many nations of the northern origin hold the mistletoe in peculiar veneration they look upon it as a medicine good in almost every disease and it is sometimes taken in food and at others separately as a decoction the leaves are used in preference to the berries, the latter being of too sticky a nature for general purposes, but many, too, suppose this plant to have the power of making the gardens bear plentifully. When used for this purpose, the leaves are cut up into fine pieces, and after having been prayed over, are sown with the millet and other seeds, a little also being eaten with the food. Barren women have also been known to eat the mistletoe in order to be made to bear children." that mistletoe which grows upon the willow is supposed to have the greatest efficacy this is because the willow is looked upon by them as being an especially sacred tree thus they no agree with the druids in regarding mistletoe as a cure for almost every disease and they agree with the ancient italians that applied to women it helps them to bear children again the druidical notion that the mistletoe was an all healer or panacea may be compared with a notion entertained by the wallos of senegambia these people have much veneration for a sort of mistletoe which they call tob they carry leaves of it on their persons when they go to war as a preservative against wounds just as if the leaves were real talismans grease grease the french writer who records this practice adds it is not very curious that the mistletoe should be in this part of africa what it was in the superstitions of the gauls this prejudice common to the two countries may have the same origin blacks and whites will doubtless have seen each of them for themselves something supernatural in a plant which grows and flourishes without having roots in the earth may they not have believed in fact that it was a plant fallen from the sky a gift of the divinity the suggestion as to the origin of the superstition is strongly confirmed by the druidical belief reported by pliny that whatever grew on an oak was sent from heaven and was a sign that the tree had been chosen by the god himself such a belief explains why the druids cut the mistletoe not with a common knife but with a gold sickle and why when cut it was not suffered to touch the earth probably they thought that the celestial plant would have been profaned and its marvellous virtue lost by contact with the ground with the ritual observed by the druids in cutting the mistletoe we may compare the ritual which in cambodia is prescribed in a similar case they say that when you see an orchid growing as a parasite on a tamarind tree you should dress it in white take a new earthenware pot then climb the tree at noon break off the plant put it in the pot and let the pot fall to the ground after that you make in the pot a decoction which confers the gift of invulnerability thus just as in africa the leaves of one parasitic plant are supposed to render the wearer invulnerable so in cambodia a decoction made from another parasitic plant is considered to render the same service to such as make use of it whether by drinking or washing we may conjecture that in both places the notion of invulnerability is suggested by the position of the plant which occupying a place of comparative security above the ground appears to promise to its fortunate possessor a similar security from some of the ills that beset the life of man on earth we have already met with examples of the store which the primitive mind sets on such vantage grounds whatever may be the origin of these beliefs and practices concerning the mistletoe certain it is that some of them have their analogies in the folklore of modern european peasants 
For example, it is laid down as a rule in various parts of Europe that mistletoe may not be cut in the ordinary way, but must be shot or knocked down with stones from the tree on which it is growing. Thus, in the Swiss canton of Argau, all parasitic plants are esteemed in a certain sense holy by the country folk, but most particularly so, the mistletoe growing on an oak. They ascribe great powers to it, but shrink from cutting it off in the usual manner. Instead of that, they procure it in the following manner. When the sun is in Sagittarius and the moon is on the wane, on the first, third, or fourth day before the new moon, one ought to shoot down with an arrow the mistletoe of an oak, and to catch it with the left hand as it falls. Such mistletoe is a remedy for every ailment of children. Here among the Swiss peasants, as among the Druids of old, special virtue is ascribed to mistletoe, which grows on an oak. It may not be cut in the usual way, it must be caught as it falls to the ground, and it is esteemed a panacea for all diseases, at least of children. In Sweden also, it is a popular superstition that if mistletoe is to possess its peculiar virtue, it must either be shot down out of the oak or knocked down with stones. Similarly, so late as the early part of the 19th century, people in Wales believed that for the mistletoe to have any power, it must be shot or struck down with stones off the tree where it grew. Again, in respect of all the healing virtues of mistletoe, the opinion of modern peasants, and even of the learned, has to some extent agreed with that of the ancients. The Druids appear to have called the plant, or perhaps the oak on which it grew, the All Healer, and All Healer is said to be still a name of the mistletoe in the modern Celtic speech of Brittany, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. On St. John's morning, midsummer morning, peasants of Piedmont and Lombardy go out to search the oak leaves for the oil of St. John, which is supposed to heal all wounds made with cutting instruments. Originally, perhaps, the oil of St. John was simply the mistletoe or a decoction made from it. For in Holstein, the mistletoe, especially oak mistletoe, is still regarded as a panacea for green wounds and as a sure charm to secure success in hunting. And at Lacan in the south of France, the old druidical belief in the mistletoe as an antidote to all poisons still survives among the peasantry. They apply the plant to the stomach of the sufferer or give him a decoction of it to drink. Again, the ancient belief that mistletoe is a cure for epilepsy has survived in modern times, not only among the ignorant, but among the learned. Thus, in Sweden, persons afflicted with the falling sickness think they can ward off attacks of the malady by carrying about with them a knife which has a handle of oak mistletoe. And in Germany, for a similar purpose, pieces of mistletoe used to be hung round the necks of children. In the French province of Bourbonnais, a popular remedy for epilepsy is a decoction of mistletoe which has been gathered on an oak on St. John's Day and boiled with rye flour. So at Bottisford in Lincolnshire, a decoction of mistletoe is supposed to be a palliative for this terrible disease. Indeed, mistletoe was recommended as a remedy for the falling sickness by high medical authorities in England and Holland down to the 18th century. However, the opinion of the medical profession as to the curative virtues of mistletoe has undergone a radical alteration. Whereas the Druids thought that mistletoe cured everything, modern doctors appear to think that it cures nothing. If they are right, we must conclude that the ancient and widespread faith in the medicinal virtue of mistletoe is a pure superstition based on nothing better than the fanciful inferences which ignorance has drawn from the parasitic nature of the plant, its position high up on the branch of a tree seeming to protect it from the dangers to which plants and animals are subject on the surface of the ground. From this point of view, we can perhaps understand why mistletoe has so long and so persistently been prescribed as a cure for the falling sickness. As mistletoe cannot fall to the ground, because it is rooted on the branch of a tree high above the earth, it seems to follow as a necessary consequence that an epileptic patient cannot possibly fall down in a fit so long as he carries a piece of mistletoe in his pocket or a decoction of mistletoe in his stomach. Such a train of reasoning would probably be regarded even now as cogent by a large portion of the human species. Again, the ancient Italian opinion that mistletoe extinguishes fire appears to be shared by Swedish peasants, who hang up bunches of oak mistletoe on the ceilings of their rooms as a protection against harm in general, and conflagration in particular. A hint as to the way in which mistletoe comes to be possessed of this property is furnished by the epithet thunderbessum, which people of the Argyle canton in Switzerland apply to the plant. For a thunderbessum is a shaggy, bushy excrescence on branches of trees, which is popularly believed to be produced by a flash of lightning. Hence, in Bohemia, a thunderbessum burnt in the fire protects the house against being struck by a thunderbolt. 
being itself a product of lightning, it naturally serves on homeopathic principles as a protection against lightning, in fact, as a kind of lightning conductor. Hence, the fire, which mistletoe in Sweden is designed especially to avert from houses, may be fire kindled by lightning, though no doubt the plant is equally effective against conflagration in general. Again, mistletoe acts as a master key as well as a lightning conductor, for it is said to open all locks. But perhaps the most precious of all the virtues of mistletoe is that it affords efficient protection against sorcery and witchcraft. That, no doubt, is the reason why in Austria a twig of mistletoe is laid on the threshold as a preventative of nightmare. And it may be the reason why in the north of England they say that if you wish your dairy to thrive, you should give your bunch of mistletoe to the first cow that calves after New Year's Day for it is well known that nothing is so fatal to milk and butter as witchcraft. Similarly in Wales, for the sake of ensuring good luck to the dairy, people used to give a branch of mistletoe to the first cow that gave birth to a calf after the first hour of the new year. And in rural districts of Wales, where mistletoe abounded, there was always a profusion of it in the farmhouses. When mistletoe was scarce, Welsh farmers used to say, no mistletoe, no luck. But if there was a fine crop of mistletoe, they expected a fine crop of corn. In Sweden, mistletoe is diligently sought after on St. John's Eve, the people believing it to be in a high degree possessed of mystic qualities, and that if a sprig of it be attached to the ceiling of the dwelling house, the horse's tail or the cow's crib, the troll will then be powerless to injure either man or beast. With regard to the time when the mistletoe should be gathered, opinions have varied. The Druids gathered it above all on the sixth day of the moon, the ancient Italians apparently on the first day of the moon. In modern times, some have preferred the full moon of March, and others the waning moon of winter, when the sun is in Sagittarius. But the favorite time would seem to be Midsummer Eve or Midsummer Day. We have seen that both in France and Sweden, special virtues are ascribed to mistletoe gathered at Midsummer. The rule in Sweden is that mistletoe must be cut on the night of Midsummer Eve, when sun and moon stand in the sign of their might. Again, in Wales, it was believed that a sprig of mistletoe gathered on St. John's Eve, Midsummer, or any time before the berries appeared, would induce dreams of omen, both good and bad, if it were placed under the pillow of the sleeper. Thus, mistletoe is one of the many plants whose magical or medicinal virtues are believed to culminate with the culmination of the sun on the longest day of the year. Hence, it seems reasonable to conjecture that in the eyes of the Druids also, who revered the plant so highly, the sacred mistletoe may have acquired a double portion of its mystic qualities at the solstice in June, and that accordingly they may have regularly cut it with solemn ceremony on Midsummer Eve. Be that as it may, certain it is that the mistletoe, the instrument of Baldur's death, has been regularly gathered for the sake of its mystic qualities on Midsummer Eve in Scandinavia, Baldur's home. The plant is found commonly growing on pear trees, oaks, and other trees in thick damp woods throughout the more temperate parts of Sweden. Thus, one of the two main incidents of Baldur's myth is reproduced in the great midsummer festival of Scandinavia. But the other main incident of the myth, the burning of Baldur's body on a pyre, has also its counterpart in the bonfires which still blaze or blaze till lately in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden on Midsummer Eve. It does not appear, indeed, that any effigy is burned in these bonfires, but the burning of an effigy is a feature which might easily drop out after its meaning was forgotten. And the name of Baldur's Balfires, Baldur's Balfires, by which these midsummer fires were formerly known in Sweden, puts their connection with Baldur beyond the reach of doubt, and makes it probable that in former times either a living representative or an effigy of Baldur was annually burned in them. Midsummer was the season sacred to Baldur, and the Swedish poet Tegner, in placing the burning of Baldur at Midsummer, may very well have followed an old tradition that the summer solstice was the time when the good god came to his untimely end. Thus, it has been shown that the leading incidents of the Baldur myth have their counterparts in those fire festivals of our European peasantry, which undoubtedly date from a time long prior to the introduction of Christianity. The pretense of throwing the victim chosen by Lot into the Beltane fire, and the similar treatment of the man, the future green wolf, at the Midsummer bonfire in Normandy, may naturally be interpreted as traces of an older custom of actually burning human beings on these occasions, and the green dress of the green wolf, coupled with the leafy envelope of the young fellow who trod out the Midsummer fire at Musheim, seems to hint that the persons who perished at these festivals did so in the character of tree spirits or deities of vegetation. From all this, 
we may reasonably infer that in the Boulder myth on the one hand, and the fire festivals and custom of gathering mistletoe on the other hand, we have, as it were, the two broken and dissevered halves of an original whole. In other words, we may assume with some degree of probability that the myth of Boulder's death was not merely a myth, that is, a description of physical phenomena and imagery borrowed from human life, but that it was, at the same time, the story which people told to explain why they annually burned a human representative of the god and cut the mistletoe with solemn ceremony. If I am right, the story of Baldur's tragic end formed, so to say, the text of the sacred drama, which was acted year by year as a magical rite to cause the sun to shine, trees to grow, crops to thrive, and to guard man and beast from the baleful arts of fairies and trolls, of witches and warlocks. The tale belonged, in short, to that class of nature myths, which are meant to be supplemented by ritual. Here, as so often, myths stood to magic in the relation of theory to practice. But if the victims, the human balders, who died by fire, whether in spring or at midsummer, were put to death as living embodiments of tree spirits or deities of vegetation, it would seem that Balder himself must have been a tree spirit or deity of vegetation. It becomes desirable, therefore, to determine, if we can, the particular kind of tree or trees of which a personal representative was burned at the fire festivals, for we may be quite sure that it was not as a representative of vegetation in general that the victims suffered death. The idea of vegetation in general is too abstract to be primitive. Most probably, the victim at first represented a particular kind of sacred tree. But of all European trees, none has such claims as the oak to be considered as preeminently the sacred tree of the Aryans. We have seen that its worship is attested for all the great branches of the Aryan stock in Europe. Hence, we may certainly conclude that the tree was venerated by the Aryans in common before the dispersion, and that their primitive home must have lain in a land which was clothed with forests of oak. Now, considering the primitive character and remarkable similarity of the fire festivals observed by all the branches of the Aryan race in Europe, we may infer that these festivals form part of the common stock of religious observances, which the various peoples carried with them in their wanderings from their old home. But if I am right, an essential feature of those primitive fire festivals was the burning of a man who represented the tree spirit. In view, then, of the place occupied by the oak in the religion of the Aryans, the presumption is that the tree so represented at the fire festivals must originally have been the oak. So far as the Celts and Lithuanians are concerned, this conclusion will perhaps hardly be contested. But both for them and for the Germans, it is confirmed by a remarkable piece of religious conservatism. The most primitive method known to man of producing fire is by rubbing two pieces of wood against each other till they ignite, and we have seen that this method is still used in Europe for kindling sacred fires, such as the need fire, and that most probably it was formerly resorted to at all the fire festivals under discussion. Now, it is sometimes required that the need fire or other sacred fire should be made by the friction of a particular kind of wood, and when the kind of wood is prescribed, whether among Celts, Germans, or Slavs, the wood appears to be generally the oak. But if the sacred fire was regularly kindled by the friction of oak wood, we may infer that originally the fire was also fed with the same material. In point of fact, it appears that the perpetual fire of Vesta at Rome was fed with oak wood, and that oak wood was the fuel consumed in the perpetual fire which burned under the sacred oak at the great Lithuanian sanctuary of Romov. Further, that oak wood was formerly the fuel burned in the midsummer fires may perhaps be inferred from the custom, said to be still observed by peasants in many mountain districts of Germany, of making up the cottage fire on Midsummer Day with a heavy block of oak wood. The block is so arranged that it smolders slowly and is not finally reduced to charcoal till the expiry of a year. Then, upon next Midsummer Day, the charred embers of the old log are removed to make room for the new one, and are mixed with the seed corn or scattered about the garden. This is believed to guard the food cooked on the hearth from witchcraft, to preserve the luck of the house, to promote the growth of the crops, and to keep them from blight and vermin. Thus, the custom is almost exactly parallel to that of the Yule log, which in parts of Germany, France, England, Serbia, and other Slavonic lands was commonly of oak wood. The general conclusion is that at those periodic or occasional ceremonies, the ancient Aryans both kindled and fed the fire with the sacred oak wood. But if at these solemn rites the fire was regularly made of oak wood, it follows that any man who was burned in it as a personification of the tree spirit could have represented no tree but the oak. The sacred oak was thus burned in duplicate. The wood of the trees was consumed in the fire, and along with it was consumed a living man as a personification of the oak spirit. 
The conclusion thus drawn for the European Aryans in general is confirmed in its special application to the Scandinavians by the relation in which amongst them the mistletoe appears to have stood to the burning of the victim in the midsummer fire. We have seen that among Scandinavians it has been customary to gather the mistletoe at midsummer, but so far as appears on the face of this custom, there is nothing to connect it with the midsummer fires in which human victims or effigies of them were burned. Even if the fire, as seems probable, was originally always made with oak wood, why should it have been necessary to pull the mistletoe? The last link between the midsummer customs of gathering the mistletoe and lighting the bonfires is supplied by Baldur's myth, which can hardly be disjoined from the customs in question. The myth suggests that a vital connection may once have been believed to subsist between the mistletoe and the human representative of the oak who was burned in the fire. According to the myth, Baldur could be killed by nothing in heaven or earth except the mistletoe, and so long as the mistletoe remained on the oak, he was not only immortal but invulnerable. Now, if we suppose that Baldur was the oak, the origin of the myth becomes intelligible. The mistletoe was viewed as the seed of life of the oak, and so long as it was uninjured, nothing could kill or even wound the oak. The conception of the mistletoe as the seed of life of the oak would naturally be suggested to primitive people by the observation that while the oak is deciduous, the mistletoe which grows on it is evergreen. In winter, the sight of its fresh foliage among the bare branches must have been hailed by the worshippers of the tree as a sign that the divine life, which had ceased to animate the branches, yet survived in the mistletoe, as the heart of a sleeper still beats when his body is motionless. Hence, when the god had to be killed, when the sacred tree had to be burnt, it was necessary to begin by breaking off the mistletoe. For so long as the mistletoe remained intact, the oak, so people might think, was invulnerable. All the blows of their knives and axes would glance harmless from its surface. But once tear from the oak its sacred heart, the mistletoe, and the tree nodded to its fall. And when, in later times, the spirit of the oak came to be represented by a living man, it was logically necessary to suppose that, like the tree he personated, he could neither be killed nor wounded so long as the mistletoe remained uninjured. The pulling of the mistletoe was thus at once the signal and the cause of his death. On this view, the invulnerable boulder is neither more nor less than a personification of a mistletoe-bearing oak. The interpretation is confirmed by what seems to have been an ancient Italian belief that the mistletoe can be destroyed destroyed neither by fire nor water, nor if the parasite is thus deemed indestructible, it might easily be supposed to communicate its own indestructibility to the tree on which it grows, so long as the two remain in conjunction. Or, to put the same idea in mythical form, we might tell how the kindly god of the oak had his life securely deposited in the imperishable mistletoe which grew among the branches. How accordingly, so long as the mistletoe kept its place there, the deity himself remained invulnerable, and how at last a cunning foe, let into the secret of the god's invulnerability, tore the mistletoe from the oak, thereby killing the oak god, and afterwards burning his body in a fire, which could have made no impression on him so long as the incombustible parasite retained its seat among the boughs. But since the idea of a being whose life is thus, in a sense, outside himself, must be strange to many readers, and has, indeed, not yet been recognized in its full bearings on primitive superstition, it will be worthwhile to illustrate it by examples drawn both from story and custom. The result will be to show that, in assuming this idea as the explanation of Boulder's relation to the mistletoe, I assume a principle which is deeply engraved on the mind of primitive man. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.